Welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with visual aids about statistics in everyday life. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they. With me today is Bart. How you doing, Bart? I'm good. Um, Bart how? My pronouns are he and him. You excited for our very first episode? Indeed. I'm terrified, I'm going to be perfectly <laughs> honest, but you know, such is life. Yeah, that's how it goes. Today we're going to be talking about contraceptives how they are measured in their effectiveness, which is not very well explained to patients, and what that means for long-term users in particular. I am going to put this upfront disclaimer here. This is not medical advice. I am not a medical doctor. Decisions about contraceptives often have other things going on than just the statistics as well. This is just for educational purposes, and hopefully everybody learns something from it, including me. So with that out of the way, but have you ever looked into contraceptive methods? Uh, vaguely. So, um, my ex-girlfriend was, uh, looking at moving off the pill and onto either an implant on rod or a few of the other options around. So I was getting the information kind of secondhand through her, but not, uh, I didn't do my own particular research. Were you told anything about their effectiveness in that conversation? Um, like, I'd say like... Uh, a small amount in terms of that she was passing on that uh, she thought that they were going to be uh, more or equally effective. Yeah. But without any kind of statistical ba- basis or anything like that. That's a pretty common starting point. So when I went to talk to a doctor about long-term contraceptive options, this was before I'd done any statistics, I went in and I'd looked up like relative effectiveness for different methods. I didn't understand what the numbers meant other than that one method was better than another because it was more effective in that sense. My yeah. doctor didn't talk to me about it either. Uh, we talked about the side effects of what I thought would be the best option for me. Yeah. But I don't know if he or in fact doctors in general really have much awareness of what these numbers mean other than this better than that. It was years later after I'd actually done statistics that I started to really think about it. So hopefully somebody else finds this as useful as I would have at the time. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, it's a complicated one because yeah, you don't have much information going in kind of thing. Yeah. And, and this is something that like it it can change your life quite literally. I mean, unintended and unplanned pregnancies can be a real strain on people. Yeah. The first thing we're going to talk about is how we measure the effectiveness of a contraceptive. It's really hard to determine when a pregnancy hasn't happened that otherwise would. This is true of events in general, from car crashes to coronavirus cases. What you can do instead is look at how many pregnancies do occur among people using a contraceptive versus the general population who are not or who, or who are on other methods. This is usually stated as a percentage. Info sheets or sex education will say something like uh, condoms are 90% effective. Yeah. Or the implant is more than 99% effective. What this represents is if a group of people are using a method, which is, say, we'll go with 97% effective in the first year of use, you expect 97% of that people to not become pregnant and 3% of them to become pregnant. So this is a first year of use. Yep. Use. 97% of users... do not have a pregnancy. What that means is the rest of the people, that 3%, do expect to have a pregnancy. So you can think of it as 100% minus effectiveness is equal to failure percentage. 90% effectiveness gives you 10% failures, 1 in 10. 80% effectiveness gives you 20% failure rate, 1 in 5, and so on. 
These numbers usually come from clinical trials. So when the method is being developed, you will have some number of medical, quite regimented trials that are run, and they look at the numbers from that. But there are also statistics on effectiveness that comes from looking at what happens in the general population once, it, once the contraceptive methods are used there. And we'll talk more about that later. Yeah. So in general, this is not a bad metric. It has the very straightforward interpretation that the bigger the effectiveness number, the better the contraceptive is at preventing pregnancy. That makes it really easy for people to compare the different methods on that basis, even if they don't have like a, a bigger understanding of what the number actually represents. Yeah. So, so I, for me, I was looking at like the implant as opposed to the contraceptive pill and saying implant has a bigger number for effectiveness. That means it's better. That means that's what I will choose. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. Does first yes. year of use, is that likely to change after that first year? That is, in fact, a very, very good question because we may or may not be able to assume that the effectiveness is constant year on year. If you have something like your implant, which lasts for three years, what happens in the first year may or may not be the same as what happens afterwards. And this is one of the limitations of this as a statistic. So I'm going to just real quick underline this first year of use bit because we're going to talk about that a bit more. Okay, cool. It's pretty rare for somebody to use contraceptives for only a year. And people like me who don't want kids are looking at 20, 30 years of ongoing contraceptive use. There are long-term contraceptives like IUDs, interuterine devices, hormonal implants that have like three, five, 10 year lifetimes. How effective they are over that lifespan may not be captured in this first year of use number. And one of the shortcomings of it Doctors don't talk to patients about this. I never had a conversation with anybody about what a lifetime of use of a contraceptive would look like in terms of the probability of becoming pregnant. Yeah. And that's a bit of a problem when you're trying no, to for, sure. for 20 or 30 years, right? <laughs> Given that what most patients get is this single year figure, we can actually use that to give us an idea of what is going to happen for longer use. We're going to do this for 20 years, but the same approach works for other time periods as well. Yep. All estimation methods make some assumptions in order to work, right? So I'm going to write down our assumptions here. Assumptions. Mm -hmm. First off. Because this is a rough approximation and because this is the data that we have available, we're going to assume that the probability of failure doesn't change over time. So the failure rate stays constant. Yes, is constant. I'm going to say up front, this is unrealistic. but. As a first effort to get an idea of what long-term use looks like, it's not a bad way to go. You can then refine that method later and potentially, if you have more information than I have available, like physiological information from clinical trials or real-world studies, you can do a lot better for individual people and in saying what is likely to happen for their lifetimes. But in a general population, this is not a bad way to go. Yeah. In our case, we're going to work through an example and we're going to say we have a 97% for us. That's our, going to be our contraceptive effectiveness. Yep. Secondly, this is a technical thing that I'm going to say, that the failure rate in one year does not depend on the failure rate in other years. We'd call this independence. Um, so what does that mean? So if I have a percentage failure rate in one year, it doesn't matter what happened the year before or the year after. It is that year stands alone. So in this case, the fact that it is constant means you have this external thing, the contraceptive effectiveness that sets the same for all years. But if you have something happen in a particular year that changes that effectiveness, it doesn't affect the year after. This is uh, mostly a mathematical convenience because it makes the calculations easier. Yeah. But w again, we do not necessarily expect this to be true for all contraceptives and all people. If you're on the implant on implant, for example, how effective it is in the first year may change to the second year because if you have the same implant in your arm, 
the rate at which the hormone comes out of it and into your blood will change over time. It drops off. This is why they last for three years and then you need to get them replaced because that drops below a threshold of which they're considered reliable. Yeah, okay. That makes so sense. Call, yeah. So you're going to call this uh, failure rate for a year. Does not depend. on other years. Uh, we call this independence. The good news is, that's more or less all we need to assume. Although there's quite a lot going in there which is not ph uh, physiologically realistic. But it's not a bad way to go at the start. So we're going to say we're looking at 20 years of use and 97% effectiveness. Within a particular year, the probability of becoming pregnant is 100% minus that 97%, right? And the probability of not becoming pregnant is that 97%. Yeah. What we're really interested in over 20 years is the probability of never being pregnant. Yeah. How we represent this mathematically is we multiply out the probability of not becoming pregnant in each of those individual years and see how we go. So we do this with our 97% becomes 0 0.97 as a proportion of 1, which would be 100%. Yeah. And then we multiply this out 20 times. I'm not going to write them all. So it's 0 0.97 and that dot 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 means there's more multiplication hidden in here. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who Wait, haven't... so they multiply? They're multiplied, yes. Okay, yeah. And if you multiply a number smaller than 1 by another number smaller than 1, it will shrink. Yeah. So... In mathematical notation, we would write this as 0 0.97 to the 20, which means you multiply it out 20 times. That turns out to be 0 0.54, which is 54%, right? You have this 97% effective contraceptive every year, but over 20 years, roughly half of people actually have at least one pregnancy. Yeah. That is a lot that is a less lot. effective, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just... Incredible. That's one of the things that's shocking to people when I tell them about this, is it drops off quite steadily over that 20 years. And this is something patients don't know about. So if you look at your various contraceptive options and you say, okay, 97% sounds quite good, and it is quite good in comparison to nothing, and don't let everybody, anybody tell you otherwise... But in the long term, it's still not nearly as effective as people think. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, half and half really, is like... <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not as good as people think. So for comparison, let's have a look at some other ones. So if we have a 99.5% effective, what do we get? Well, I'm not going to write out the whole multiplication, so I'm just going to write this as 0 0.99% five to the 20, which means you multiply it 20 times. And that turns out to be 0 0.90, approximately. There's some decimals after that, but let's go with it. So that's 90% effective over 20 years, which so, is way better. Yeah, in that 2.5%, you have it's a, this is a, huge difference, <laughs> a massive difference. Right? Yeah. So this is only 1 in 10, as opposed to 1 in 2. And... Uh, to give you a bit of a surprise, let's look at something worse. So zero, so ninety percent effective, which is going to be zero point nine to the twenty. Would you like? To, would you like to guess? Uh, it's got to be less than half. <laughs> yep, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hazard any further? Uh, I'm going to go like thirty percent. 
Oh boy, you're in for a surprise. 12%. Shit! If you have a 90% effective year on year, oh, that should be, yep, that's correct. Yeah. If you have a 90% effective year on year, 88% of people expect to have a pregnancy at some point, at least one. Oh my God. (laughs) That's huge. (laughs) And, and, these small differences in percentage, right? They, these really do add up in the longer time scale. Yeah. Um, and so is the assumption that people are going into it in terms of doctors and things like that, that y- you will not be taking it for the entire 20 years and at some point you will want children? Is that kind of... Uh, it depends, it- right? So, so these things are very culturally specific. So if you're doing it for five years, you can run a similar calculation. Uh, I'll have to pull up a calculator for this. But if you want five years, yeah. what you do is you take the 0.97, whoop, that's a 7, and you'd raise it to the fifth power. Which, uh, let's actually, let me pull up a calculator. And we want 0.97 to the fifth. So, over five years, that gives us an 85% effectiveness. Yeah. The same calculation can be done on shorter timescales. Yeah. But this is still not a conversation that doctors have with patients. It's a similar idea in the sense that a more effective contraceptive on the single year will still be more effective over the long term. But how much that effectiveness changes matters. Yeah, twelve percent from ninety is Oh, it's pretty <laughs> staggering. bad staggering. <laughs> well <laughs> Yeah. And what's what's really throws me about this is that even websites with information about birth control don't discuss this. Wikipedia's page on comparing birth control methods only has this first year effectiveness statistic. Yeah. And that's just kind of standard. Now, I have to stress, because I am a pedantic statistician, that this is a rough estimate for a population, right? So if you have 100,000 people, this is the sort of thing you would expect to see over that entire population. What happens for an individual may not be this experience, right? Some people will become pregnant. Some people will not. That individual's life history is not determined by this chance. It's just a population representation. Yeah, no, it's it's more in the it's in the over the general population rather than to the specific yeah. individual who is taking the contraception. Okay, okay. Yes, and I have to stress as well that for people who do not want to be pregnant in any period of time, this is worlds better than nothing. I refuse to let anybody use this recording <laughs> as an argument against contraceptives in general. For a point of comparison, the quote-unquote effectiveness of no contraceptive is 15%. Yeah. So, that means 15% of people in the first year of not using contraceptives are are not going to become pregnant, or would probably not become pregnant would be a better way to phrase that. What that looks like over 20 years is you get a number with 17 zeros after the decimal point before you get to a three. So it's minuscule. Basically, over 20 years, unless you have an infertility problem, chances are you are going to have at least one pregnancy without contraceptives. And you're likely to have a lot more pregnancies as well. Yeah. Like, one of the things that people forget about what happened before the advent of contraceptives is how many pregnancies people would have yeah. over the lifetime. Like you would have seven to 10 surviving children potentially, but you, that's an awful lot of time spent pregnant, breastfeeding or both. Yeah. My dad has more than a hundred first cousins. He's yeah. Really far out. Yeah. As bigger than my family, although both my parents come from... Like, my mother's family had seven kids in it. My father's had five. Yeah. Um, So, it has changed remarkably over the last hundred years. As promised, 
We also need to talk a bit about how these effectiveness numbers are calculated in the first place. Information packs and sex education classes usually give one or both of two statistics that get called perfect use and typical use. Yep. I have heard this. Ideal or perfect use generally means that the statistic was calculated from clinical trials of the method, which have pretty strict adherence guidelines. But at the same time, clinical trials tend to exclude people whose physiology may interact with the contraceptive in a way that makes it more or less effective. They're not a good representation of the general population. So clinical trials exclude people who will... Yes. Wow, that's... Yep. Uh, This isn't necessarily bad, depending on what it is. So if you have people who are known to have risks associated with a medication family, you probably wouldn't have them in the clinical trial on the basis that their safety may be compromised if they're in it. Yeah. That's fair enough. No, that's reasonable. But there's also stuff like hormonal contraceptives, so the pill, the contraceptive implant are known to be less effective in people with large bodies because there's the hormone, or even this is true of a lot of drugs in general, is less effective when it's that diluted. Yeah. So there is a a, a threshold of weight, for example, where you're not recommended to be on the pill because the effectiveness drops off. And This is also not necessarily something that is discussed with patients, or is discussed with patients in a way that is incredibly fat phobic and just makes them feel like shit all the time. Yeah, so does that mean the clinical trial would have weight restrictions as well? Potentially. I There have been hundreds of clinical trials on this stuff, and I haven't looked at every single one. Yeah. But it's not uncommon to have particularly large people or people with health complications excluded from clinical trials. Right. Yes. That's a comforting... <laughs> medical stuff is complicated and the the science of medicine is not nearly as clear cut as it tends to be presented to the public i think one of the things that coronavirus has really taught people is how that sausage is made right we are seeing live the sorts of stuff that goes into creating vaccines testing vaccines and people may not have been exposed to that before yeah it's uh yeah it's more it's top confronting it's, sometimes. It's more top of mind, like exactly how things are <laughs> operate. Yeah. Typical use, on the other hand, is generally you go out into the real world, you look at a whole bunch of people who are using the contraceptive in their everyday lives, and you see what happens in terms of whether or not they become pregnant. The difficulty with the typical use thing is that you don't have control over a lot of covariates. By covariates, I mean other things that can get in the way. Up to and including proper use of the contraceptive. For the condom, for example, typical use statistics include did not use it a particular time that the person had sex. Yeah. Which means that the typical use statistic for condoms may not actually represent the true, in quotation marks, effectiveness if you even just use one. But it's, uh, that kind of makes sense. But it's more representative. Yeah, it makes sense. It's more representative of what actually happens, right? Um, yeah, it it more kind of goes on human behavior than it does on, uh... (laughs) Yeah. Well, for stuff like the pill, if you forget to take doses, that's not uncommon. Yeah. But it does change the way that the contraceptive works. Yeah. Observational studies in general, by which I mean you don't control things, you just look at what happens. They often have like self-reporting problems. So with like real world use stuff, you can do things like ask people, what has your contraceptive method been for this period of time? And they will tell you whether or not they've been consistent in its use. But they won't necessarily be honest that, that because... won't well it's, it's not even a matter of honesty so much as somebody can say yes i use condoms but they might not use it every time they have sex it's still their primary method of contraception but it's not consistent yes okay 
It's very hard to control that. Yeah. Now we're going to have a look at some examples. Three of them, to be precise. And uh, if I scroll down, we'll actually have we have a table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Fuck. The first one gets called the male condom, but that's a shade transphobic, so I'm calling it dick condoms. Yep. The pill and the implant. The first two are here because they're extremely common, and the last one because it is the most effective, even more so than IUDs, and relatively few people know about it. Promise that I am not being paid by big implants. <laughs> they just happen to work really well. <laughs> We're going to look at the first year perfect use and typical use as reported in... I'm going to put this in the show notes. The paper is Trussell 2011. And this is a paper that is widely cited for these statistics. It's kind of... It, it refers to a whole bunch of clinical trials and summarizes what comes out of them or even like observational studies and summarizes what comes out of them and has then itself been referred to. Like Wikipedia has this, so it's a, for example. So it's a meta-study? Is that what I'm... A meta-analysis meta -analysis, is, yeah. I think that's the word you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, it's a summary of other research yeah. is the way to think about it. Okay, let me have a look at these numbers. The perfect use for the dick condom in the first year was 98%. For the pill was 99.7%. Mm -hmm. And for the implant was 99.95%. I'll put these percentages in here. But I'm going to put a big asterisk next to that for a reason we'll talk about soon. Yep. In the typical use for the dick condom, it drops to 82%. Which, if you think back to our uh, demonstration of the 20-year effectiveness, looks pretty bad Ooh, yeah. already. <laughs> for the pill, it's 91%. Again, not, not great. great. And uh, for the implant, it's going to get another 99.95% and a big fat asterisk. Right away, we can see the pill and condoms have a much lower effectiveness in typical use compared to their perfect use and lower effectiveness in the implant overall. Yep. Let's talk about that asterisk. I'm going to quote directly from this Trussell paper. Not one of 15 clinical studies has reported an Implanon failure. However, pregnancies during use of Implanon have been reported. We arbitrarily set the perfect use and typical use failure rates for Implanon at 0.05%. So the 0.05% failure converts to a 99.95% effectiveness, yeah. right? They pulled it out of their ass. They... They may, well, there are reasons to give it a high number if you have 15 clinical studies with no pregnancies, because that's roughly one in 2,000 users who would expect to see a failure in their first year, right? Yeah. But they did not really do the analysis that they could have with the information that was in front of them. You can do better. In fact, we're going to do better. Okay, hell yeah. So... <laughs> I went and had a look. So among those 15 studies, there were, let me get this number right, 4,593 participants. If I could spell it would help. Right? Yep. That's quite a large number of people. None of them had a pregnancy over the course of those studies, right? In all 15? That's, yeah, that's the total number uh, yeah. of people across the 15 studies, yeah. right? That's four and a half thousand data points that you can use to make a reasonably justified estimate. You don't have to go, oh, we had a guess that seemed reasonable, right? You, you can use this information. It's right there in front of you. One very basic method of this is to use what's called half the level of detection, which is the minimum number of events that you could identify. So in your 4,500 participants, the smallest number of pregnancies you can detect is one. The yeah? smallest? Yeah, okay, yep. Which in our case, so our level of detection is one pregnancy in 4,593 people. That is your level of detection. 
if you go for half the level of detection, which is a standard that's used in a bunch of safety stuff, for example, so workplace health and safety, yeah. you have thresholds that are based on this. Half of one pregnancy in that many people is one pregnancy in twice that many people. So half level of detection is one in... Now, because I don't do calculations of the fly, I have this written down. <laughs> 9,186 people. This gives us an estimated effectiveness of 99.989%, which is pretty close to 9995 but considerably better justified. Yes, and as we discussed earlier, the small percentage points are over a year <laughs> will clearly feed out yes. <laughs> over the long term. Yeah, but this is for the um, this is for the clinical trials. Yep. So you do have to be a little bit. Well, I I didn't look at the typical use stuff because I have better data that we're going to talk about in a second. But you can still do things with the people who don't become pregnant. That is information that you can use. And this paper didn't, and is potentially one of the most widely cited sources of this statistic, <laughs> which is infuriating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to put in black under here that 99.989%, which is what we've estimated as a reasonable actual value for this. Okay, now that that particular bit of rage is out of the way, <laughs> we're going to look at the three-year typical use. So this is from a different paper which looked at a global study across different contraceptive methods for what happened in three years of use as opposed to just the one. Yep. And so this is Polis et al. 2000, oops, 2016. What they asked people in this case was, have you been using the same method for three years? What has happened over that time? Did you become pregnant? Yep. And so the three year typical use for the dick condom was 84% effective. For the pill, it was 84.9% effective. And for the implant, this is real world in situ, it was 98.9% effective. I would say this three year typical use is probably a reasonable estimate for long term behavior. Yeah. It's real world data, it's an extended period of time, it's not just the first year. And it's like, you could do some stuff with this to talk to patients about their long-term contraceptive use that you can't do with, for example, the first year perfect use numbers. Yeah. We're going to use this to do better calculations of the expected use over 20 years. Yep. Yeah. Right. Originally, what we had was our percentage raised to the number of years. So it was no 20 years, right? But because we have three-year intervals, we need to change that. Because it's no longer we're looking at 20 years, we're looking at 20 years in three-year blocks. But the good news is that's relatively easy to change because we just divide the exponent three, by yeah. three. So this is the effectiveness percentage. So what that would look like for the dick condoms is 0 0.84 raised to the power of 20 divided by three, which you can do. I would not do it manually. This is what calculates. <laughs> I do not do these calculations by hand. Bugger that. But over 20 years, using this three-year typical use, you get 31% effectiveness for the dick condom. You get 33% effectiveness for the pill. And 92.9% effectiveness for the implant. My God. <laughs> it's a world of difference, right? That is insane. Again... This is population level statistics. It does not take into account the way that a person's fertility will change over yep. time. But that's not a bad guide for long term use. How's like that that is a <laughs> sorry? No, I'm just astounded How's... by like <laughs> that this is yes. not information that is like talked Literally about. Yeah. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, doctors don't necessarily have the statistical training to talk about this stuff yeah. well. And it's not necessarily widely advertised because for the end user, what's probably the most important information is which is the best, in quotation marks, form of contraception. Yeah. But if you cannot take 
different forms of contrac- contraception or if things are a consideration for you like I don't particularly want to get a needle stuck into my arm to implant something or I don't want to get go through a procedure to get an IUD this long-term use really matters because that might change your mind about the risk you're willing to take in using a contraceptive or not. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. I have one last segment for us today. In the future, I intend to get listener questions for this, but as it's the first episode, we don't have any listeners yet. I've asked some friends for a statistic they would like to know about, and one request which was, I think, quite appropriate to this is talking about COVID vaccine effectiveness. Ah, yes. Okay, so we're going to call this COVID vaccine effectiveness. And the first thing to say, this is not measured the same way as the contraceptive vaccine effectiveness, which is annoying, but also understandable. Yeah. There are a bunch of different vaccines floating around. All of them have an effectiveness measurement, but effectiveness of a vaccine is measured in a way that doesn't like take into account the absolute risk. So the numbers we were talking about before were a person's chance of becoming pregnant. The vaccine effectiveness is not measured as a person's chance of catching the disease. It's relative to the unvaccinated population. Oh, okay, yes. So, so if something... I'm going to write this as measured relative to unvaccinated. Which, of course, makes it uh, somewhat darkly funny all the people who refuse to take the vaccine on the basis that they don't want to be part of a, a clinical trial... They're the control group, yeah. <laughs> realistically. <laughs> so as our example here, we're going to look at the Pfizer. And the statistic we're going to think about, because I'm not going to go too in-depth on this, is it, it has been said in clinical trials to be 95% effective. Yep. To understand this, let's say you have 2,000 people in your trial. 1,000 of them get, are vaccinated and 1,000 are not. So we're going to split this up. Yeah. Okay. Of the unvaccinated people... we have 140 get infected with COVID during the trial. This is the number that is reduced by 95% in the vaccine group. Ah! So we would see 140 times 1 minus 0.95 because the 95% is the reduction, which is 140 times 0.05 which is 7 yes right so this is very very different to 95% of the vaccinated group not catching the virus that would be 50 cases and it also means that um, vaccine shopping is not the most useful thing either because you're (laughs) well it it, that's that's a whole other discussion right Because this is about relative risk. If you are vaccinated, your overall risk is lower, independent of how much lower it is. But certainly I can understand wanting a more effective vaccine. The problem I see is that people who are waiting for a more effective vaccine, so in Australia, for example, we have the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are the predominant ones at the moment. And AstraZeneca is less effective overall. I think the studies that I've seen put it at 80%. But it's more readily available. And it is better to have your population vaccinated early with a less effective vaccine than three months later with a more effective one because you will prevent more cases in that intervening time. Yeah, no, that makes sense. 
it's yeah, it's a really fraught issue because this is one of those things where the interests of the individual aren't well explained in the context of the interests of the community. Because even if you're an individual looking at trying to get the most effective vaccine, you will want that vaccine earlier rather than later because over that period of time it will reduce your risk more to have yeah. it early. So the the effectiveness of the vaccine must be counted against the time it takes to get it. I suppose is the way to think yes. about it. Yes. Yep. And if you can do it early, it's better than doing yeah. it late. Although I have to put a word of caution in here when comparing these vaccine effectiveness statistics that come out of clinical trials, the way that those clinical trials are conducted are not necessarily the same. So from a kind of puritanical statistical perspective, you probably can't directly compare clinical trial numbers. They're basically used to get a vaccine approved. Yeah. If you want to look at how effective a vaccine is, you need to look at population studies of what's happened once people actually yeah. get it. And that's harder and takes a bit more time to get access to. No, that makes sense, yeah. So we, we don't I also have... really, really wish there was better communication with this stuff. <laughs> it would be nice. <laughs> that's kind of... Oh, it's kind of universally true for statistics, right? But it's specifically true in this case because it's such a pressing problem yeah no and um like what you just conveyed to me was quite easy to understand but at the same time it's never conveyed to you as like just a normal member of the public you are somewhat biased to the fact that you're somebody who's willing to sit down and have statistics inflicted upon you <laughs> sure <right? laughs> most people who would otherwise present this stuff to the public generally assume that as soon as they put numbers in front of people they yeah, switch okay. off which i don't think it's always true and i think that with a pandemic like this where people are finding out that actually this stuff does affect them every day they are becoming more interested yeah. in it but there's also a lot of people who have had such a shit experience with maths because they've been badly taught or just had a shit time in school in general that they are genuinely anxious about dealing with numbers and that's not their fault but it does make it difficult to communicate this stuff to the general but public. with that said, like, my school sent me a letter at the end of year 11 telling me not to do year 12 maths. Um, I'm not... <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I'm not, great, I'm not great with numbers either, but when it's kind of explained to you in a way that's understandable, the numbers start to make sense in your head kind of thing. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I was making this podcast on that, actually. <laughs> But it is also difficult to sit down with somebody. Like, this is kind of a one on one conversation, effectively. We happen to have yeah. an audience, but it's somewhat removed from us. And you can ask me questions back, which is more difficult to do if you're a news that's announcer. That's true, yes. Well, that's everything I've got for the moment. If you, dear listener, have a particular statistic you would like to know about, send me an email at statisticallyinsignificantpod at protonmail.ch. This will also be in the description of this podcast. It can be a number or a chart that you saw in the news, something on Facebook. I love Facebook. It's so good <laughs> in the sense that it gives me lots of material to get extremely angry about. Or something that's been spread around in your group chat and you have some questions about. Thank you, Bart. And uh, we'll no, see you next see time. See you next time yourself, Tess. Have a good one. You too.